Hi, um, so Holly, the reluctant reader, and on today's episode of Authorised, we are going to be talking about this really interesting book called Size Zero by um, the author Abigail Mangin, who has kindly joined us today to have a chat about her book. So, Abigail, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and a summary of Size Zero? Yeah, Size Zero is a weird book. <laughs> it's about a young novice monk who has to go back to his family modeling agency empire when his disappeared ex-girlfriend reappears 10 years later as a skin coat on the fashion runway. So it's kind of a dark, dystopian look at New York and the fashion industry in this weird world of Visage, which is the modeling agency that is connected to his, or sorry, the fashion world that's connected to his family. Brilliant. And um, did you relate any of the aspects of the story to the real world modeling industry? Yeah, so unfortunately, it's not as dystopian as it appears. Um, I spent a little bit of time in the modeling industry um, as a 16 year old, which is actually quite old for model. Um, but I looked into it kind of because I knew I was a writer, even <laughs> at that age. And I kind of knew it was really, really hard to become a writer, especially as a young girl from rural Pennsylvania. So I thought modeling would be a good way to get in because I was naturally very thin and naturally very tall. Um, little did I know <laughs> that uh, modeling is kind of about stripping away the personality, not kind of highlighting it. And I think shows like America's Next Top Model made me think that modeling was 20 year olds who had these brilliant bubbly personalities and they were cover girls. Um, when actually um, the first recruitment event I went to was a group of 12 to 16 year old girls, hundreds of them. Um, we had to wear bikinis uh, into these like kind of dark dingy rooms and there were a bunch of model agents in their like 40s and 50s who were kind of interviewing us like you'd interview in a res like in a, just a job interview except mm -hmm. we were 12 to 16 and after that kind of normal interview you'd end up being in a situation where you were measured with measuring tape um like around the butt around the boobs uh touched inappropriate like what would be considered inappropriate except for in this setting um yeah. all kind of normal it because the model agents are often very nice they're very charming um and some of them are very nice people like let's be very clear but you know even if they're trying to be nice it's just a very awkward situation you're dealing with somebody who's very young they're taking polaroid photos um of your like bare face and of your body um and i think especially at like age 12 when you're kind of prepubescent that's a really difficult thing um but what ends up happening is these girls kind of get sold this idea that modeling is this beautiful thing and you can become very rich and you can become a supermodel it's a good way to get out of poverty or get out of whatever situation you're in um and the parents kind of buy into that or in some cases they don't have parents at all um and then these girls end up kind of being parented by these model agents um with very little money and they don't get paid very much because very few models actually make it and even those that do you know you can do a a runway you can do a fashion week show like a big show with a big big brand and get paid very little because then it's considered an honor to be in that show right. so competitive that you know you you want that that runway show no matter what because the selling point is you know if you do i don't want to name any names but if you do a big luxury fashion brand runway show then maybe mm -hmm. you can get a walmart deal you know and yeah get, get like a you know a big kind of supermarket deal and and, and the grocery store kind of commercial brands make a lot more money even than the luxury brands. So that's kind of the sell. But the problem is these girls end up in situations where they don't have any money. They don't have parents. They're living in a bunch of different apartments all over the world with like seven other girls and they're 14 years old and they've got to do their laundry and get to where they need to be um, with taxis. And, you know, it's, it's a really sad situation. And a lot of times they can't speak the language even mm -hmm. where they are. So they're kind of lost. Um, and it's very easy to take advantage of them, unfortunately, because uh, they're desperate, you know, <laughs> uh, they, they have no hope. So, you know, the agencies end up telling them, even when they do get paid, uh, it's supposed to be like a 10 to 15% cut that you give to the agency. But what happens is the brands pay the agency first. So if you get, if you make a hundred dollars on a photo shoot, the money goes to the agency and then the agency says, well, your portfolio cost $200 to print. And yeah. your housing costs such and such. And you bought this hamburger the other day. And so that hamburger costs this much. And you end up not getting any money in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, outright don't tell you how much money you made. 
Um, and sometimes the agency doesn't get paid. I mean, I, my experience with doing small modeling jobs is that a lot of times the fashion brands don't even pay appropriately and they don't even pay in the right time. So it's, it's very tricky and it kind of lends itself to really bad things um, like the Epstein situation, which MC squared model management um, is known kind of, well, is suspected of providing girls to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and there's a, there's a really wonderful Bloomberg article on this. Um, and I have a blog, blog article on my website about kind of the connection between sex trafficking and Jeffrey Epstein and um, the modeling world. But it's kind of unfortunately a predatory setup, right? Because you're, you're getting these very young girls who are underprivileged in a lot of cases. Um, and they're kind of slaves to the system. And they don't really have much choice um, if they're told, you know, you need to do this for me. If, if the model agent is in a parent role and they're approached, they're approaching these young girls and they're like, you know, you have to go to this place and you have to do this. Um, so MC squared is kind of the one that's connected to all of the bad things we're hearing about right now. Yeah. So I, I remember sit, reading that in your book around Epstein and, and obviously it's not kind of explicitly talked about as such, but you can kind of tell as you're reading through and I was like, mm, okay, so that's, that's really interesting to, to understand that. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, you know, it, I, I didn't explicitly set out to write about the, the kind of social injustices that happen in the modeling world, but I think it, I, I started writing this before the Epstein thing broke. Um, he wasn't arrested or anything um, yeah. yet, but I knew about Jean-Luc Brunel from MC Squared, and I knew, um, just knowing about sex trafficking, how easy it would be. We have these girls coming from all over the world, and they're very young, and they're the perfect target for this, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation. Definitely. So, how did you start writing, and in particular, um, how did you get plot inspiration? So, obviously, you've kind of started searching on that, but it'd be great to understand a bit more. Yeah, um, so I came from Pennsylvania, <laughs> uh, and eventually I did end up in New York, because I went to NYU for dramatic writing, which is a screenwriting program. Um, and there I ended up kind of experiencing New York, which was a bit of a kind of culture shock coming from a rural place anyway. Um, and also being near MC squared in Union Square, <laughs> that's where they're based, uh, or that's where their New York office is based. So I was already looking into this connection between sex trafficking and the modeling world. And then, uh, it turned out I was right there and it sort of felt scary, if I'm being honest. Um, and I, I wrote a 60 minute play for NYU, um, kind of detailing what I had experienced myself in the modeling world, which was kind of this, this dynamic of, you have this model agency, you have this model agent, you know, either man or woman, um, both are bad, <laughs> uh, kind of talking to this young child, trying to get something out of them and try, you know, they're half naked in a bathing suit, um, getting pictures taken, being measured, um, and that feeling of being kind of a commodity and being an object, but then also somehow being on parity with the model agent. Um, you, in some ways you're treated like an adult in that dynamic and in some ways you're treated like an object. So it's very confusing for a young person um, and disturbing because you, you on one hand need this person to give you jobs and you also need this person to guide you through life because a lot of times your parents aren't there in those photo shoots, they're not there on those runway shows. So you're relying on this person for a lot and you have to kind of trust them and you have to have a close relationship, but that also lends itself to its own strange dynamic um, in which, you know, you have this full trust in this person and they can really take advantage of it and abuse you and kind of use their power for, for unjust ways. So I think what I was exploring was this dynamic in kind of the general scheme of what I was going through myself, which was kind of trying to grow up in New York City uh, with a totally different background myself. So I had to learn, you know, in what ways do I need to change to adapt to this new environment? What way, in what ways do I need to grow up? Because um, I think in modern age, you know, we're all kind of growing up until we're 30. Um, yeah, yeah. I think maybe even beyond that. Maybe even yeah. beyond that. <laughs> up forever. So we're, you know, and how, and I'm so fascinated by that process, you know, how, in what ways are all, are we all enslaved? In what ways are we all subject to power? In what ways are we subject to ideologies and religions and trauma from our past? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think, you know, Cecil Leclerc being a monk, he, he goes to the monastery because he's trying to escape hell <laughs> in, in the New York modeling agency world but he doesn't fully have the maturity and the understanding of himself to take on such a big, you know, religion and, and life choice. So he goes to the monastery and I think the abbot sort of takes on this poor boy, um, hoping just to kind of educate him. Um, but he's a novice monk and I think the abbot is thinking, okay, this kid, <laughs> now that his, his ex-girlfriend has shown up as a skin coat, he needs to go back and discover who he is. I mean, yeah. really have that conviction in who he is. Because if he is a monk, then great. That can be decided later. But first he needs to go back, strip himself of this kind of fake monkness um, and rediscover who he is, which is, is a kind of tricky process as we discover because he goes from a very sheltered kind of fluffy understanding of religion, which is not really how religion works. <laughs> you know, he has kind of this fake sense of like, God is great and, you know, God's complicated. Uh, he he has to go back to New York, which is, he realizes even worse than he remembered, you know, seeing your mom in a whole new light, seeing modeling industry in a whole new light, and having to deal with the fact that your, your girlfriend disappeared when you were 15 years old, and you don't know what happened to her, and your mom might be a culprit. And, and, and dealing yeah. with all of that, dealing with the fact that your family isn't perfect, and dealing with the fact that, you know, it's complicated, and how do we grow up, and how do we deal with something Oh, a, a society that is quite corrupt, even though it's beautiful at the same time. Yeah, I think he's definitely, it's interesting to see how his character evolves, what I think unravels is a good way of putting it as the story goes on, and how actually he's, he's quite complex as a character, and it's quite interesting to see how he's, uh, the friction between kind of his new life and his old, and how th th those clashes are quite challenging for him to navigate around, so I, I, I thought quite interesting in the story. Um, so how long did Size Zero take to write and what advice would you give to other authors? So it's a, it's a tough question because <laughs> I started writing the model agent Cecil's mom, Margot Leclerc, about seven years ago. Um, she was kind of a character that I just, I wanted to explore this kind of blunt, brazen model agent who was kind of not a very good person but also just struggling in her own ways and in other ways a great person. So she came about and then um, some of the model agent characters came about and over that process I sort of discovered the story. Um, but I'd say in terms of the actual writing it took about four years um, and on and off kind of just shaping the characters and shaping the plot. Um, the characters have changed a lot over the process of rewriting this multiple times. One of the things I really, really struggled with was making Cecil likable. Yeah. Because, um, ironically, you know, children aren't the most likable of people, especially when they're a 24-year-old child um, and they're naive. But I think we all are, and I think, you know, I, one of my big inspirations is Pinocchio, um, which I actually didn't realize until I was, like, three drafts in to my book. I realized that my, my story had a lot of similarities with Pinocchio in that it's kind of about how are we puppets and how are we able to free ourselves from um, the strings that are attached to us and who's pulling those strings and how do we fight them. And, um, you know, I think with Cecil, it's sort of, it's very difficult to make him likable and yet petulant. <laughs> um, likable and then trying to do the good thing, but then yet also kind of being a little bit backward. Um, and with, with Pinocchio, Walt Disney had a really, really hard time making him a likable kind of cute puppet instead of a petulant child kind of hurting people and doing terrible terrible things and lying all the time because in the original Italian story that's very much how the character is mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in originally Cecil was kind of like an alcoholic like partying porn addicted like terrible 24 year old which unfortunately is like a lot of 24 year olds in, in New York City but <laughs> it's not necessarily a pleasant thing to wrap our heads around and um, the monk just felt like an absolutely perfect fit. Um, that actually came in like halfway through the process. And I think it's the thing that made the book for me because I think I was dealing with my own, I'm still dealing with it. You know, I'm gonna deal with it for four more books in the series, <laughs> but kind of, you know, where am I on, on religion and spirituality? And, um, you know, I came from a Judeo-Christian background and then I got rid of it and now I'm lost. <laughs> you know, and it's like in New York City, not having any kind of fundamental belief at all is very, very tricky. 
um, and especially when you're dealing with some really corrupt characters. Uh, so it's about how do you, you know, if Nietzsche's right and God is dead, how do you deal with that? You know, how, how, do, you, how do you get through a corrupt society and, and come out as a strong, brave, kind person um, without getting corrupted? And how do you help change society for the better? Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, what other advice would you give to, to authors who are kind of starting along their journey? So would you, have you got any like top three tips? Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> it's, it's so funny because I find a lot of the advice that I've gotten over the years is like not very helpful. Um, <laughs> so, so take it all with a grain of salt. But um, I really don't like the advice to write every day because I think it puts, I mean, I'm like an industrious person. So it ta it's, it's hard for me to kind of process that because some days I can't write. Um, for whatever reason, you know, maybe my health's bad or, you know, and then I feel really bad about myself for not writing. So I think the trick is for me anyway, to have a set schedule and to treat it just like any other job. So, you know, I, I have a set time. I have to be in my office at my desk, um, at least sitting there <laughs> until yeah. the end of the day. Um, oftentimes I'm doing research, I'm doing plot work, um, I'm developing character. I'm very rarely actually typing out a scene. You know, if I'm if I'm doing an eight hour workday, I'm doing three hours of typing. You know, the yeah. rest of the time is, is plot development, trying to figure out what what does the character want in this scene, what's the point of this scene, <laughs> does it still fit in the plot? Do I need to rewrite something? Um, you know, and then the other half of my day is trying to figure out how to fix problems, almost like fixing a jigsaw puzzle. You know, how do I get yeah. these pieces? If I if I want these two scenes, how do I get them to work together? Um, but yeah, the, the routine thing I think is the only thing I can hold on to, honestly, as, as, <laughs> that's the only advice that I can actually give myself because everything else is sort of tricky, right? Like, you know, every, some people say you should do an outline. I'm, I believe that actually, but I don't think that's true for everybody. Um, especially if you're writing like a memoir or something, like maybe that should just come from your heart. Um, so I think all other advice is kind of... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, taken, you know, I think routine's probably accurate, but everything else. Take it, take it or leave it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what's your favorite character in the story in this first book and why? <sighs> I mean, it's, it's Margot Leclerc, unfortunately. <laughs> as, as brazen and blunt as she is and as awful as she can be. Um, I find it's refreshing at least to write her because she will say whatever she wants. And I also, I don't think she believes half of what she says, which is such a fascinating dynamic. You know, I think she sometimes says things just to be outrageous, um, just to get attention in the way that she wants to. But there's actually something truthful about that. You know, there's something truthful about saying whatever you want and, and not necessarily having conviction in it. Because I think a lot of times people say things that they don't truly believe but we can't perfectly communicate our feelings. You know, as, as great as words are, they're not 100% accurate. So everybody's kind of performing, and I think Margot has taken it to the next level. Um, <laughs> and I think Margot's open about her performativeness. I think, I think Margot acknowledges that she's not being truthful, and that's maybe the most truthful we can be. Um, and I think she's going to have a redemption arc. You know, she's not all, all terrible. So, no, she's she's pretty messed up, but yeah. <laughs> you see as the story goes along and kind of like without giving anything away, when she kind of goes into the place that she ends up kind of towards the yeah. end of the story. Like and I think do I you see her at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, and I think I, I think it's briefly mentioned in book one, but she she's from New Orleans and she grew up kind of in a cemetery cremation situation. Um, she had a really rough childhood. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that excuses some things, maybe it doesn't. But um, that's going to be delved into a little bit deeper later on. But I mean, Ava's another favorite. Ava seems to be the kind of audience favorite. Um, mm -hmm. She's kind of, she's the model. She's the representative for all of the, the models in the book. Um, and we kind of get the most out of her character. But I think, you know, she's in an actual Pinocchio state where she knows nothing about herself. You know, um, every time she's asked about her past, she makes up a Disney story. And I think that is that's where she's at. You know, she's been so traumatized by her model agent and by going to prison that when we meet her, she's still a child. You know, she's, she's yeah. almost an infant. Um, and she has no idea who she is. So watching that develop is fun for me. You know, I've plotted everything out, but everything yeah. always changes. And 
Um, you know, I, I, I tend to leave things pretty, I, I know all of the events that happen in my stories. So I, I kind of plot everything, you know, the next four books are plotted that I know what events happen, but I don't necessarily know what choices they're going to make within those. And of course the choices affect the events that come, but it, it all kind of, it's like there's fate, you know, and if, if you want to call it that way. And so those events are set in stone, but wait, no, the characters have their own free will too, at least in my opinion. Yeah, she, she is a really fun character. And I think that as, as the story progresses again, you, you see more and more of her character come up and her, her quirkiness, I think really kind of makes who she is. And like you say, that the way that she kind of frames her life in this sort of fantasy, um, you can definitely tell that her actual real life has obviously, obviously impacted on, on that as her character. So it'll be to see where she kind of goes and how she grows or uh, from, from this point on. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Visage in general. Um, so Visage is it's obviously about the book, a series of books, but there's a little bit more to the company than that. So can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, I mean, it's something that's still sort of in a beta test, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Um, but it's, I've, I've kind of built up Perdona's fashion brand um, because I think that I like experiential things, you know, and I think this story, while it's a, while there's a lot going on in it, I think there's an interesting world there. And I, I think, you know, fans have expressed some interest in kind of experiencing that world further and having eventually a whole world to go with it. Um, mm -hmm. So we're kind of experimenting with building Visage in real life, like building the fashion brand um, and making products that Perdona would make. Um, and eventually, too, we have in mind doing charity work in, in relation to it. Um, we have to obviously either pair up with a charity or make a charity, um, but something to do with the sex trafficking or, you know, the kind of issues that we're dealing with. Um, so that it's kind of a whole interactive experience and um, a community, I think. I think, I think I'd like eventually um, for the series to kind of have a community of, of fans who you know, appreciate, like, because it, it's, it's sort of a weird book in that it's, it's a world in and of itself, even though it's, it's, it's based on real things, there's sort of a fantasy element to it. Um, so yeah, you know, Comic-Con <laughs> is probably the place for us. But yeah, we have, like, this is one of our things, like, we have a little, little backpack. Um, Very cool. Libra logos on it um, that Perdona has in the book. I was going to say, and from what I have looked at, and then obviously what from the book, there are subtleties between the kind of the products that you have and elements within the book in terms of like the materials and stuff is there. Yeah, I mean, eventually I'd like to go full visage in the sense of having all of the, you know, the trinkets. Because I love oddities, you know, I love, you know, golden skeletons and things like that. I'm not, I mean, not that dark, but kind of the naturalistic element to it. I mean, I... Yeah, yeah. I really relate. So Perdona is obviously, we haven't gotten into Perdona, but she's an interesting person. <laughs> you know, um, her fashion brand is at once a great thing and at once a terrible thing because um, she's abusing these girls. She's abusing the models mm -hmm. that, you know, portray her products. But then I really connect to what her, her overall goal is, which is this kind of like naturalistic worldview, right? Where everything is made from natural materials and you know, she has this product called the dial that, you know, you can touch the air instead of touching your iPhone. It's like an iPhone, but it projects a screen onto whatever surface you want. So it's more tactile. You're not staring at a screen. You can talk to people almost face to face because it's a projection instead of um, a cold screen. And I think, I think her overall goal is quite beautiful. Um, I think her vision is quite beautiful. I think her brand is quite beautiful. Yeah. So it's an interesting, I, I don't know, I mean, I'd be interested if anybody has any feedback um, who's read the book or is just curious about, about the whole world and, and the concept of a visage in the book itself. Like, I'd love to hear what people think, so. Yeah, I can definitely see immersive experiences and, you know, like art installations and things like that would be really cool stuff to do with, with the concepts. So it was, it'll be, yeah, I look forward to seeing what, what you come up with over the next couple of years. Um, so it's teaser time. Um, what's next in store for 
books and also do you want to sort of tell us about the competition we're going to run? Yeah, so I'll start with the competition because uh, that's fun for all of you probably. Um, so we're going to give away this backpack that I showed earlier, this one, um, and a paperback copy of the book. Um, so that's that. <laughs> you, can, you can sign up for that. Um, and then book two, which is coming out in September of 20, well, hopefully September, let's just say fall of 2021. <laughs> um, it's, it's getting there. It's almost coming together. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's really exciting so far, at least to me anyway. Um, the mall, for those of you who've read book one, becomes a very, very big thing in book two by accident, um, unfortunately, because Cecil, as he's trying to kind of make his way in the modeling world is kind of making a lot of mistakes. Um, he's trying to use his power for good and he's trying to, you know, at least use some of the things he half learned as a monk um, to reform the industry, but he makes a lot of mistakes and it leads to some big consequences. Um, that's probably as much as I can say without giving it all away. <laughs> no, that, that sounds great. I think that's a good enough teaser. So obviously size zero is out now. Um, can you tell us where we can get it from and kind of rough price points and um, yeah, that would be yeah, great. Google's probably the easiest place. Um, in the UK, Waterstones has, a few Waterstones are carrying it already, um, but Amazon's unfortunately probably the most convenient, as, as, as complicated as Amazon is. Uh, so the, the ebook 633 and the, um, there's an audiobook for, for 20 if that's more your thing. And then there's a paperback for 1350. Fantastic. So go out there, pick up Abigail's book, and we hope you enjoy it as much as, as we have. Um, and make sure that you keep an eye out for the competition which is launching um, later today. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you.